Welcome to Compassion in a T-Shirt and our short shares with Professor Paul Gilbert. In episode one, he speaks about his journey from childhood and adolescence through training and research, arriving at a model of the mind and the inception of compassion-focused therapy. Well, welcome, uh, Professor Paul Gilbert, to Compassion in a T-shirt. Uh, you are, of course, the inspiration of this channel. Um, so it, it is a great honour to have you here and, and to have a chance to, to speak with you. You, you might not remember, but um, we first met in 2014. Uh, so you, you were down in Byron Bay in northern New South Wales and, and presenting your introduction to, to CFT workshop. It was all wonderful, but I, I remember when you played the, the clip from Goodwill Hunting, and um, which at the time I actually hadn't seen the movie, believe it or not. I, I felt very um, slow on the uptake there, but, um, but it, 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 it sort of brought me to, to sobbing tears at the time, you know, like it, it, it really kind of moved me. And, and um, I was sitting next to our friend, James Kirby at the time. And he sort of, I think he was like, oh, and, and he sort of, you know, gave me a little pat or something. But it was a very moving and, and uh, important sort of moment for me. And we, we've sort of had interactions, many interactions over the years since then. And, and I, I must admit, um, you know, I, I learn something new every time. So uh, can't wait to, to have this this chat and, and maybe learn some more. We'll see. Well, it's but a great pleasure, Stan. Thank you so much for inviting me. And you're, you're doing wonderful things with your podcasts and your YouTubes. It's terrific, really, to get this stuff out there. And, you know, it's, it's just a privilege for me to come talk to you today. Oh, thank you very much. You yeah, know, I, I think we if we can get the message out there, that's that's absolutely kind of the goal. So I, I had a few specific questions for you, and, and I thought we could, um, you know, kind of pose a bit of a, a general question, and then kind of riff off that for a little while, and, and perhaps move on to the next one. And, and really, I, I I wanted to start sort of a little bit at the beginning with with you, and and, um, and maybe just see, you know, if you if you wouldn't mind just telling us a bit about maybe your early life or, you know, kind of even childhood and adolescence. I mean, a big part of, of CFT is, is sort of we're born with certain brains, but then, you know, shaped by experiences. And, and so I, I was curious about all that and especially maybe kind of compassionate people that influenced you, you know, all those years ago. Sure. Um, well, the story is, as you, I think we've stuck before, I was born in Africa. I was born in Ghana. Um, <clears throat> after the war, my father went to Africa because he was very traumatized. A lot of parents of my generation were very traumatized. He was in the RAF and was blown up and had friends die with, you know, and all that horrible stuff. So he was quite traumatized and that tragically did show sometimes in his parenting behavior. Um, <clears throat> so the whole generation was really, so, so he just took off after the war. And um, so I was born there and then I grew up there for a while and uh, saw some interesting things, which I suspect had an impact on my subsequent development. I mean, I remember once, because we lived in the outback. I mean, he wanted to just not, he just wanted to get away. So we lived in the outback, no running water. No, <laughs> we used to cook on a, on a stove, a wood stove and that sort of thing. My mother used to go mad because there's always snakes around. She so I'm going home, there's too many snakes. Um, so, uh, but I remember one day, you know, uh, in, the, in this sort of hut we were, and this um, person had got out of a leper card in me. And so he came to the house uh, looking for money. And I, I don't know where my parents were. I tried to find some for him. I couldn't find any. But that image of the intense suffering of this person that all his hands had been eaten away and everything, I'd never seen anything like that before. So I remember being very moved by that. And also an awareness of the immense suffering around me, you know, in terms of, what was going on but also you know a lot of people in the villages because I've interacted with young kids in the villages couldn't speak very much a little bit of their language but you just used to have, play around with the football or something they were all quite joyful and which was kind of interesting so but those days of self-education and various other things uh couldn't last forever so then I was sent back to 
boarding school, uh, which wasn't, you know, in those days, boarding schools in the early 60s were pretty harsh places. You know, we used to get caned a lot and all for all kinds of stuff, which today I think would be regarded as not on. Um, I'd only been there two nights, two days, and we got caned for talking after lights so out. That was a real shock. Um, so that was a pretty, a pretty tough. And the concept, I think, probably of entrapment um, uh, and the inability of not wanting to be where I was uh, was very strong uh, as my in my lessons. And as soon as I was able to get out, I was I got out. Having said that, you know, I was very lucky because I was in a group where we were very. We had strong bonds in a sense. We were a very friendly group. The group above us, less so, but um, had some really good friends uh, during the five years I was there, six years I was there. And um, so I just actually met up with a couple of them more recently, um, so 50 years ago. So that was good part. The, the, the affiliation, the concept of um, connectedness through peer group relationships has always been very, really quite important to me. So then after that, off, uh, I got out and off I went to college and uh, then found, you know, young adolescents got into playing guitars and joined a band and I was going to be a, <clears throat> a band. We, had, we played up and down the south coast of England, you know, doing covers mostly uh, back in the USSR by the Beatles, that sort of thing. But there were so many wonderful bands then. Uh, a, a couple of them uh, went up to London, had contracts but didn't really make it. And so I, I just wanted to continue to have fun. So I decided to go to university. But uh, th in those days, I went as an economist, I did economics, <clears throat> which was good because actually it gave me a way of thinking about interacting processes. So I was, was very interested in, in building models of economies and you had to understand how, you know, the rates of trade and inflation and all these things interacted to produce um, economic growth and so forth. But I didn't really think that was the future for me and in those days you could hop and chop about quite easily so um this is an interesting story so i applied to a couple of places to do what is called a psychology changeover degree where they'll take you from another subject and then they'll fast track you through psychology there were two one was in aston and near birmingham and the other one was at sussex brighton on the south coast and i wanted to go there you know because it was just a nice campus but I didn't get accepted. So by this time, my father had moved from Africa and was now in Dubai. So I flew out to Dubai to have a holiday there. And I'd only been there um, two months, I think, because I finished my degree, I had my I'd got a reasonable degree. So I went to get a holiday. And I got a call from Sussex to say, somebody's dropped out of the course. Uh, would you like to come? So I jumped on a plane, went for the interview and everything. And it turned out, the story that I was told subsequently, it was turned out that... The person that was there, Stuart Sutherland, was a well-known person who had a bipolar condition. And on that day, when they said to him, we've somebody's dropped out, you know, do you want to pick off this uh, shortlist? And he said, oh, I don't know. Let's choose him. He's an economist. We don't normally have a god. He looks OK. Just get him in. And <laughs> so my journey into psychology was incredibly fortuitous. And so when I got there, it was I didn't know this at the time, but it was primarily for biologists because it was a very biologically orientated degree. Well, they had zoologists and biologists and you know, all these things, you know, chemists and people. Uh, uh, so when they said, what's your background? I said, oh, I'm an economist. They said, what an economist? Um, I found a couple of other people actually who had also been economists and done it. So that was, so then I did the MSc in experimental psychology, which was very much into uh, conditioning and uh, physiology and that sort of thing. But what interested me was that there was really no integrated science. It was all these separate little studies. You know, you could do a bit on the brain, you could do a bit on language, you could do a bit on social learning, but there was no connectedness at all. I remember talking to a couple of colleagues and saying, you know, what about developing a model of how the mind works? And they said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't do that. That's far too complicated. <laughs> we just need scientific studies, you know. Um, and my neurophysiology wasn't really up to it. So I, that, I did actually fail that exam. Right. <laughs> I remember being asked this question. Um, what happens if you reverse the polarity in a motion detector? 
<laughs> what oh. are you talking about? And apparently the answer is if he comes to detect it in the opposite direction. So you've got motion detectors in your eyes. So if you reverse the polarity, instead of detecting movement from the left to the right, you you now detect it from the right. So I didn't know that. I didn't know that. <laughs> Fail. So I was stuck then. I had to reset that exam. And in order to do that, I went and worked as a psychiatric nurse on an acute intake hospital in Brighton. Now that was interesting because in those days, we used to have a lot of people coming down from London and other places. And of course, they'd get completely stoned on the beach. And uh, it's just <laughs> and then they'd come and stay in our hotel. Um, some of them were really quite poorly. Uh, but it was really quite an interesting um, experience there. And also we had some very, not very well people on the acute unit. We also had students who'd broken down and ended up on the acute unit. But that, so I did that for a year nearly and met Jean and played a lot of cricket because I was in the cricket team. I met Jean <clears throat> and then we did my neurophysiology exam and did okay, got passed that fine because I'd been studying that for years. So that, that really got me very much into the biological stuff. And um, then off I went to Birmingham, which didn't work out, but I was able to transfer to Edinburgh and got a, my started my PhD with Ivy Blackburn, who was the first cognitive therapist really to do a trial in the UK along with Oxford. And she was terrific. I mean, she was just ideal for me because I was, I was her first um, PhD student. And she really just nurtured me through the whole process. I mean, she was an extraordinary, wonderful person and <coughs> taught me things like Socratic questioning and so on. And I was given an office on the actual ward. Now the ward was an MRC, it was an MR medical research counseling unit. So we used to take all the worst uh, uh, cases, all the most suffering cases of depression from all over Scotland, North England. But I had this office there, and the the professor of psychiatry, because actually it was really a um, um, primarily looking at antidepressant drugs. So look, you just spend your time talking, just talking to people. You know, you don't, you're not, you're not a trained clinician, but you're a psychologist. You're doing your PhD on depression. Go just talk to them. So I did, and so I spent many hours just wandering around the rules sitting by the beds talking to people some people so poorly they could hardly talk to you couldn't get out of bed i mean they really you know with some forms of depression just lock you down completely but learned a lot of stories about um depression and you know this constant theme of the sense of being defeated and hopeless and worthless and so forth so it became very clear that depressed people get very bogged down in a way of seeing the world and of course because cognitive therapy was a big thing happening and I was very lucky because Tim would come over to, uh, Aaron Beck would come over and Ivy would take me down and I'd be part of the training with Tim Beck and we'd have lots of discussions about things and he wrote a lovely um, endorsement for my first book in 84 so that was the love that was a wonderful time really in, in many ways learned an awful lot um, and then um, wrote a book one of the things that used to happen on the MRC units, we had, used to have these discussions about the physiological changes in depression, you know, and, um, you know, they could demonstrate very clearly that, you know, when people are depressed, they have higher cortisol, the dopamine systems are off, you can get changes in metabolites and cerebral spinal fluid and everything. There we are, that shows it's an illness, you see, it's a disease. And there was a whole group around the world, actually, beginning from probably the late 60s, maybe 50s, late 60s, so they were saying that, you know, you can have very major physiological changes associated with psychosocial effects, you know, and um, in 1975, uh, uh, Martin Seligman published his book on learned, called Learned Helplessness, so, and I was just studying my PhD there then, in Edinburgh then, and this was very clear that, you know, you subject animals to uncontrollable stresses and they show all the changes in the brain that you would see in somebody who was depressed. So this was very clear evidence that brain states could be changed by psychosocial factors. And so my first book was actually called From Psychology to Brain State, 1984. And I've just got the copyright back. We're about to reissue it. So you can see the history of it. Um, so that was really brain state theory, and that argued a lot, went all through the evidence about the three basic models. There was the model of uh, <clears throat> helplessness, there was the model of attachment loss, what happens to the brain when the severe disruptions to attachment, and there was also social rank, which is what happens to animals when they get severely defeated or harassed or bullied. And again, you see all the same kind of changes 
uh, and uh, <clears throat> and individuals that have been harassed and defeated, they just behave just like um, depressed people. They hide away. They very anxious, very timid, stay away. So that was the model I became interested in. And then a colleague of mine said, um, "You need to talk to John Price." You know, John Price was the guy that had been pushing the the evolutionary um, social defeat model of depression. So I thought, oh, okay. So I talked to him and I, I wrote to him and, you know, he, he actually wrote back, said, oh yeah, I don't, you know, if you're interested in this, we'll, we'll talk about it. So, and then I met Leon Sloman, who was professor of psychiatry at, in um, Toronto and so on and so on. So and then we developed this group in the eighties, which was an evolutionary psychopathology based group. who we also had a little journal at one point uh, based out of Texas, and then I became president of that in the 90s. Uh, and that was great because all of these people were really interested in the evolutionary dynamics of depression and linking it into physiological change. So, so I was very interested in all these, the evolved process, the evolved basis for brain states, really. And, you know, people say I'm a third wave cognitive therapist. I've never been a third wave cognitive. I don't believe in third waves, personally. There's science. And that's it, you know, you know, we try and understand how the mind works and that's what we do. So we use a lot of cognitive therapy. Of course we do because those techniques are evidence-based and so forth. But really there is a distinction between the models of intervention and the model you have of your mind, you know. So, um, <clears throat> so that was Edinburgh and that was terrific. And uh, uh, again, people like Abby Blackburn, because you were asking me who I would be grateful for, uh, he would, she would be one, um, certainly guided me a lot. And also uh, a guy called George Ashcroft, who sadly passed away some years ago, who was the professor of psychiatry. He was just lovely, really. And, um, you know, he got sitting on all his ward rounds and he would ask me questions I wouldn't know anything about. <laughs> but I learned a hell of a lot, just talking to people, listening to case formulations and all that. But then I wanted to... Um, trained as a clinical psychologist so um had my phd just got married and i did actually get a, offered a job at stanford so i was very excited about that but uh, that fell through so come 1978 i didn't have a job because <laughs> i turned down all the british uh, all the english uh, courses because i was going to stanford you see very narcissistic um but managed to get a place in norwich so then Jean and I went down to Norwich and then we I got clinically qualified, did the clinical qualification, and then we had our children, and then we thought it was a nice place to live, and so on and so on. Uh, but eventually, for promotion reasons, we then moved to Derby and we've been here for 30 years. And then I uh, set up a professorship at the university and I set up a mental health research unit, which generated a lot of papers and research on the social rank model we developed measures of social comparison, submissive behavior, you know, defeat, hopelessness, entrapment, all those things were developed during the 90s and early 20s. And um, uh, uh, so that was that part of it. So there you go, Professor Paul Gilbert's journey through life. In the next episode, Paul describes his key revelations through his clinical work and research that brought him to compassion-focused therapy.